thank you very much and thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> um, really looking forward uh, being here with you today, having the possibility to uh, enlighten you a bit about the process we've been through and the ideas and visions behind uh, the work we've been done, been, been doing. And talking about it under this uh, important agenda of talking about sustainability, it's a term that especially we have election day in Denmark today, so everybody's talking about sustainability. It's the hot thing. Uh, but what I think is important, what we're also seeing today, is really how, what does this mean for us when we are talking a sustainable agricultural practice? And uh, this is really what I would like to bring you a bit through um, from the background, from my perspective. <clears throat> As mentioned in the introduction, um, I founded Agro Telly back in 2015, having been at both uh, university doing research uh, as well as in industry. Uh, my interest especially is within uh, the sustainable soil management. That has what has been driving me in, in the development of robotics uh, and seeing how automation and precision farming are tools with uh, enormous power to really make differences in the system that we're looking at today. So based on this, um, back in 15, uh, when I started out, Agro Telly was on the vision of being able to supply with technologies uh, solutions that could help farmers to become more reliable, uh, more profitable, and especially also more sustainable. Um, in 2015, that wasn't a very hot word. Uh, it has become that uh, since then. Uh, and, and today it's a major driver for our key investors also that how we can use technology to enable this. What we want to do this through is not just robotics. Uh, we know robotics is what journalists like because it's easy to take a picture of a robot running around the field. The core of what we would really like to work with is the systems approach, how we can automate, uh, we can understand the complete system from task uh, preparation uh, execution, documentation, uh, traceability in this system and using the automation in the whole context of this. So this is what drives us today. Uh, it drives us as bringing these products to farmers. Uh, we are not researchers. We are not uh, uh, kind of like a research institute in that way. Our scope is to bring technology, uh, but we can only bring it to the farmers and sell it to them if they can make money. And hopefully through that, we can also make money at some point. We have uh, heard in the previous presentation about some of these pains important for, uh, for any farmer, not only Danish or uh, here in UK, uh, whatever we in Mexico and Brazil, in uh, Australia, we see the pains from the farmers being the same. Uniform repetitive working conditions, uh, this could might as well have been a Danish lady helping uh, cleaning up the vegetables. We still see immense amount of manual labors in vegetable production today. We have been listening to soil degradation, an extremely important part and something that farmers are very well aware of. Um, we also see society requiring more from us on optimized use of both pesticides and nutrients. Um, and at the same time, we also have a growing population that requires more food. Uh, so that is pains that we see is general and also some of the drivers that we see that can use technologies to overcome these. But one of the most important pains that we meet is from a farmer's perspective, what are we used to do? And of course, as uh, anxious, technology-driven engineers, we would like to bring the new solutions to the farmers thinking back to how, much to, uh, how many years it took going from the horse to the tractor on a full, not one farm, but in farming in general, this takes time. And we meet this one, what are we used to do? How are we used to thinking about our cost calculations, our way of managing the fields? And this is really one of the major things that we are spending a lot of time on in maturing the mindset of how we can actually change some of these things. And back to that, even back to the basic uh, understanding of the growth uh, of plants. And that's where this is not just engineering in equations where we can put in uh, all factors. This is a biological systems, and this is important and also something that's extremely important for our development team to understand that this is not something where you have a fixed system that works everywhere. We need to understand the biological system 
And I think that's one of the major challenges from a lot of the robotic companies that we see today is it might be technically well-gifted uh, people starting up a robotic company, but the understanding of the agronomy is, is extremely hard and really where we see the major challenge here. And that's also why whenever I have new engineers, we actually start taking a training course in what is agronomy, even though they came, come with a lot of years of students, uh, student time at the university. For us, and, and one of my images that I always love to show them, the most intelligent implement system that we had for within the last 100 years, I think is important for a, an, a young engineer to understand where we're actually coming from, but also being able to transform that system into something an engineer understands. So we have our fingertips today, if we walk behind a horse, actually tried to do plowing, where you can feel the shear moving through the soil. Um, when you walk the soil, even when you walk uh, across your lawn, you know what's the moisture content, how does the soil feel. Um, we have uh, more or better cameras, some need uh, enhancements, but still we are able to see details to a very, very high degree and react upon it quite fastly. So we can, we can really do a fast reaction on whatever sensor input we get. Um, we also have a limited amount of pull force. So we need to uh, adjust, we need to understand what the system can perform. So this horse will tell us if we are loading it too hard, um, uh, even though it's uh, communicated um, wirelessly, we've done that, so nothing new in this. And from the horse mindset, we have been sustainable for quite many decades. But the fun thing is really taking this from an engineering approach, sitting with young engineers and looking at this, understanding the complexity of what task we're doing, and then asking them, how much of this can you find here? And I think that's where we've overcome a lot of the other things with a big engine. And then we have an air-suspended, air-conditioned cab, preferably with hot coffee and Netflix, then we can do the task. But we're forgetting we can't even see behind us anymore. Uh, so this is really where we see the main difference here in how have we mechanized ourselves uh, into maybe an off-track era. And that's where, even we're talking about robotics, what I see as a main driver, which was mentioned in the previous two talks, sensors are really some of the ma major game changers. We see them from new innovations with satellites, with drones, but especially also real-time sensing on board and operation, looking just ahead of it, analyzing what we are doing, as well as analyzing what have we been doing. So this, this real-time sense reason acting is something that uh, is coming and it goes through the whole growth season and creates a huge amount of data that, uh, that we need to learn. We've been talking about this in precision farming for, yeah, since the mid-80s. Um, so there's nothing new in it from us when we're talking here as agronomists and agricultural engineers. What we see now is what are the new things that has been an enabler for us so we can actually put this into practice. This is an example from a, a, a previous PhD study, again, on how we can look at data before and after so we can actually manage even simple operation as seedbed preparation, having a scanner looking just ahead of the seed drill, evaluating behind to look at the cloth size, look at how well we've compacted. So we have a lot of technologies that can come in play to actually analyze what are we doing and how fast we are doing it. Um, we can also do that with some camera technologies. A colleague, I think maybe this is some of the why engineers like this, so you can see the speedometer. This is in kilometers per hour. Uh, so we're running around 60 kilometers per hour. You can see the flash going off once in a while. Uh, and these are pictures we can take with 60 kilometers per hour driving it down the field with standard technologies today. So we have it, and, and most of you have cameras with extreme capacities and processing power with very low cost units today. So this is what we see as the drivers also from our perspective in, in a commercial. And that's what we've tried to tie together in, in a solution where, well, combining uh, 25, 30 years of experience with precision farming and site-specific management together with management of big data. We had in, uh, in the first talk a talk about how much data we actually create uh, with robots. 
we are really looking at an immense amount of data. And that's where the artificial, artificial intelligence is an extremely powerful tool to look through this, um, to understand that. And that's where the robotics and the automation comes in. It helps us both ways. The whole infrastructure, the digital infrastructure today, enables us to have a robot that can perform tasks automatically in the field because we can survey it, we can share data. But that also opens up for us in an agronomic context because now we suddenly have a digital highway where the whole digital infrastructure is there and is needed to have a robot running. So with that digital infrastructure, we can now suddenly use that to also add all the agronomic input. And then we can add different types of uh, more experienced or uh, complex machinery uh, to this. Um, and through these combinations, um, we can benefit from what robots are good at, doing the same thing over and over and over again. They go, don't get lazy. They're right foot or, I don't know, left foot. On the, the speedometer, a speeder um, is not getting heavy as you are getting maybe more lazy. You want to finish up, go home. If you tell the robot to go 4.2 kilometers per hour, it will go 4.2 kilometers per hour. We also have the light machinery. We heard a lot about this. And I, th I think this is an important part where we can see as soon as we can remove the cap, the whole equation of calculating cost per area unit differs. And therefore, the machine size uh, has a uh, completely different va uh, uh, valuation where it's the investment into the implement, either being strip cropping or no-till or in vegetable production. It's just carrying it, and we can do it from a different uh, calculation. And then with this infrastructure, we can bring this information back to the farmer. So whatever the robot perceives out there, we have it already digitalized. We can share it, and we can bring it back home. Uh, and through that, both from a farm perspective, have the data to document it. We have it from a legal perspective. But we also open up now, and I think that's where we all have a huge task. We can actually show today the amount of energy in joules used per square meter to give you a complete uh, carbon footprint calculation from your bag of potatoes. We know precisely how much pesticides, nutrients have been spent. So all of that data, can we change that into a valuation that can help the farmer sell this data also when he's selling his uh, consumer goods? So all things that we can in, uh, use from this kind of documentation. There's also the sustainable agenda. We know there are certain of these, uh, um, uh, the UN sustainability goals that helps us perform it here. We see it with the subsidy programs. That's, of course, one benefit. But we also see uh, this as something that our society acknowledged and we, that can help us actually do something about it, both talking about water, talking about the soil quality. Um, I've showed you some of the pictures from our robot. I'll come back to more the engineering part. I know there's a lot of engineers here who also like the nerdy part, so don't worry, I'll come back to that. Um, but I think we've showed something in, in robots. It's not only our robots. Um, our good colleagues in France working with uh, Dino, same idea. We can use the same infrastructure. We can use the same automation to do large fields. Uh, so NIO have been one of the first uh, colleagues on the market really to push a commercial product. But we saw the, uh, the John Deere R8 being launched earlier this year, the 4th of January, where it was revealed by John Deere. So I think for us, we were actually celebrating that day because our investors called us when the big guys are starting to show something like this, then we know we're onto the right track. Uh, it's not just something that will come in, the, in 20, 10, 20 years. Um, so we see a lot of new of these technologies being taken in. Um, this is the Danish farm dried robot. Um, this is its operation speed, 800 meters per hour. But again, no fuel, running on solar power. So you have no running cost. You have the investment and the depreci depreciation. So it's set to cover approximately 20 hectares of sugar beet. It can perform the seeding and then uh, uh, four to six times of weeding during a season where it will just stay out there, cover the field. So co commercially sold today and uh, actually with this season, they've sold more than 200 of these robots around Europe for commercially farmers. 
So this is something that is happening right now. Uh, uh, Gary, uh, the um, um, founder of uh, Gus, uh, a Californian spraying company, started out actually as contractors, but their major pain was they couldn't get labor force. So they went from actually being a contractor to developing their own robotic system simply to manage how to do this. So this uh, Gus robot spraying system uh, have now been sold more than 180 units, uh, typically in California, Florida, and Mexico, for managing orchard spraying. And again, if you've ever visited an uh, orchard in Mexico, they don't do a lot with cabins and so on, so running around uh, doing mist spraying like this, understand why there's a market in this, uh, and, and hard time getting laborers for it. But it really shows that these are numbers that two years ago, they were more or less non-existing. So this is really something that is catching on very fastly on the market, ensuring that we don't know how the robots are going to look like in 10, 20 years. We see a lot of different approaches to how they can look like. And I think that, that, was, that was the important to show that we also see farmers acknowledging this, so they buy robots for the specific pains and the specific tasks they have. Talking to an, a, a group of engineers and agricultural uh, agronomists, I would also like to show you a bit more into where we're coming from. And, and I really loved uh, what Paolo mentioned before with the whole modeling. We believe this is one of the core elements in really pushing our development speed up in the future. So I'd like to take you a bit through some of the things that we've been doing for the last uh, five, seven years on how we've been using uh, a model-driven approach uh, using cyber-physical system to actually uh, speed up this development. Because as all of you know, and when we're talking about yield experiments and we talk about robustness of yield in experimental setups over years, this is typically a very complex because we are limited by weather, we are limited by growth season and so on. And that's where, from an engineering perspective, we can run so many thousands of simulations that can help us in speeding up a process and minimizing cost of uh, prototyping. Um, we have, and we've been doing this also with uh, strong uh, universities here from UK. I believe that there are uh, research groups here in both in the UK and Europe that are extremely strong in, in this domain and something we benefited uh, from when we are when we're taking this approach. Um, trying to show this is um, one of our early simulations where we actually have a full combination running in, a, in gazebo where we have hydraulics, mechanics, of course, but we use the first elements of our modeling to start also the interaction of how to test a control system, when to send control signals to a sprayer, turning on and off, having this together with navigation, so that when we are managing this small field simulation-wise, uh, we can use it to test suspension, uh, to see how different variables in our system uh, work, but we can also use it to test out uh, emergency stop or trigger different situations which might be difficult to provoke in, in real time. So moving that same simulation to the real world, that gives us the possibility that we only need a few examples, a few setups in the real world to validate our model, to either confirm or tell us, okay, there might be work, we have to go back to the drawing board. And that has been an extremely important part. So from the point when we uh, start so, uh, to sell our first robots, we were actually only built four prototypes, uh, physical prototypes, for validating our model-based approach. Um, and that's a very, very low investment in hardware compared to what I've seen previously in my career we are normally doing within agricultural business. Um, Simulations can also be done to look much more into the dynamics and the consequence of what happens to the soil. Uh, and this is one of the elements that we're using today so that we, we can see what are elements. So if we need a stone or we have a, a trench uh, in the field, uh, it could be a furrow from a plow, we can see how would this affect not only our steering system, but we also know to the suspension, to the control system, what would be the impact of it. And this is an important part from our engineers because we can run so many simulations, tweak small variables to enable us to the point so that when we move to the field, we can foresee, but we actually have now also a system where we can record data in the field 
from a development perspective, send that back home and run it in our simulator to see if we can actually uh, either uh, replicate a failure so that we can understand what went wrong out there because we can run the data. So we actually have it today. We've sold uh, more than 35 of that model of robot. And whenever anyone presses uh, the red bumper, which is right here in front of it, or triggers any of the emergency systems on the robot, it will dump the last 10 minutes of data. So it's always buffering 10 minutes of data, and that will be data dumped back home to our server at the moment that you press an emergency signal. So that means our service guys, before you can even press the number, we already have the data in our simulator to start reproduce what might have went wrong before someone calls from the field says something went wrong. We already have that digital copy of what have happened for the last 10 minutes. We can't store all data. I'll come back to how much data we actually could give you as researchers if that was the point. But this way of looking at how the model now also can help us from service improvements to this interaction with the customers. Because the robot we have running the first way is in Melbourne, Australia. It's a hard time flying in a service technician from Denmark whenever there's a problem. And that's where this helps us in replicating whatever they might foresee uh, when they're doing testing with our robot. The soil is, I think, is really the interesting part from my perspective, because that's what we start working something. Uh, and I believe the major impact from sustainability we will have when we're looking at fertilizing, weed management as uh, initial parts. And that's why we're not only looking at the dynamics of the, the robot, but we've also done studies. This is from a soil bench. I know I've seen a lot of the publications also by Goodwin, others uh, 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 from UK. It's hard to find this kind of soil bench today. Uh, luckily, we actually have very good colleagues uh, in different sites in, in Europe where we have access to this and where we're also moving find element modeling uh, using different discrete element modeling to model the, the soil interaction not really to make the soil model, but to understand how much power we are using, but also that tool being pulled through the soil affects how the robot is going to steer, and that changes with moisture, with compaction, so on as we've seen. Um, these models we have had, they are also developing, as you can see, the, sorry, um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, um, so we, we know the displacement of soil molecules. We can calculate how much energy. We also know how much we will wear that share. This is still relative rough aggregate uh, we're doing today, but we get a very good assumption on how much energy we need to do for a certain weeding operation. We can calculate the counter reaction from different soil types to our control system. So when we need to run with millimeter accuracy of a robot, we have all this data we can use as input to really optimize continuously the way we want to work with the robot. Because the farmer actually doesn't care about this kind of model. It looks fancy, especially on a PowerPoint, but from a farmer's perspective, he just wants to make sure that we remove as many weeds as close to the crop as possible. We can't remove them all. There will always be a safety margin, but we need to get as close as possible. And this is how we can use this kind of tools from an agricultural engineering perspective to help us achieving that accuracy to really give uh, the benefits of what I believe the robots can bring to a farmer that is difficult from a huge tractor system today. Giving you some insights, um, not a sales pitch, but just showing these are, is a, this is a mixture of uh, videos from this season where we have, uh, as you can see, a number of different uh, agricultural implements, standardized implements um, used for typically single seed seeding um, in various high value row crops. Um, the benefit for us is we've built a system that is targeted in utilizing all these implement manufacturers have spent decades in optimizing shares, um, dosing, metering systems, et cetera. And what we are then focusing on is building a robot that frames, uh, it embraces the implement and can take a standard implement and having the safety system around it as a basic, but also having all the data, we know what is happening in between it. As you can see, most implement tools are working between the rear axle, 
So that means we have all tools placed between the rear wheels. That means that's the most stable place in the whole construction. And that means even though we control and navigate with the front wheels, we have an extreme stability in our tools. This is one of the things where we can see for both very high value crops where the robot can go extremely slow, but as well up to higher speeds where we are going um, up to six kilometers in, in autonomy today, um, which can be done for standard yeah, sugar beets, uh, maize, etc. cetera. Um, elements where we know when we've been doing the seeding, we know within millimeters, okay, then we can do the weeding according to where we've been doing this. That gives us possibilities to do this kind of like blindfolded. Uh, and therefore, the second part of a lot of the operations that we've been doing this year is seeding and weeding. Um, so these two in combination is where we see the strength uh, of the robot. Here, a very high value crop. We are talking uh, more than uh, 25,000 uh, euros in trees standing at a plant nursery. That's something different than if you hit a, a sugar bean. Uh, a sugar beet. Um, so you have uh, growers here that are very intentional, that stay on track. Um, but it's also more standard operations, which could be farmer beans or sugar beets or maize, that can utilize this repetitive mechanical weeding as standard operation. But also in, in potatoes, is something where we see being repetitive, going back, doing the same operation again and again, is the fundament for the business case for the farmer. But when we start doing all of this thing, it gives us a possibility to record a lot of data. Because as you can see, we might pass the field the first time when we do seeding, and then we do four, five, six times of weeding. Potentially, if it's a, a conventional farmer, we also have passes of spraying. And that opens up for the possibility uh, to really utilize uh, the data infrastructure. And that's where I think it is the big thing we are standing in front of is what is the data that we will be really benefiting from? What kind of data can we share? Uh, how, how can we do this? How can we structure it so we can start having the, the business cases laid out for the farmer? We have done something so we can say recipients that we use, fuel, um, pesticides, nutrients, is of course something that is easy to lock. But having a camera system that whenever we're in the field, we can actually do a growth modeling. So across the field, we can see a cold area of the field. We can see growth stages slower emerging than in, in other areas of the field. And that's where cameras, commercially available cameras from automotive industry is what we're using today for a, a standard robot today, being able to, to map, for example, soil, crop, wheat, or quality of work along with the work we're doing. And then in the infrastructure, this might be from an online perspective where we can see the robot running up and down the field. But whenever we've been in the field, we have a complete log file. We know precisely where we've turned, when we did it, and how much energy we've been spending in doing each small turn in such a field. And this opens up for when we have consumers starting to ask for what is the energy uses for my bag of potatoes or my pumpkin or uh, tunips. Um, when we know where we're at, at which time and which recipient we've been using, we can also add all the economic data that we would like to into this infrastructure. And suddenly having the full data archive uh, in a mapping service where we're basically using standardized uh, de facto standards made by Google and Apple. Because though some of you might have Apple products and some of you might have an Android, you can still send an SMS to one another. So we have a lot of de facto standards where we have, I think, maybe f making some flaws in agriculture. We try to make too many standards for agriculture. But looking at the business size and to into automotive and especially gaming industry, there's so much other things that are pushing these standardizations which we can benefit from. And that's why the cameras we have, this is uh, our standard surveillance system. The image to your right is our out the front window. So this image you can have as the operator, you can have it on your laptop, you can have it in your mobile phone, so you can really have it in front of you and see, this is what you would see if you're looking out the front window, and you can look out the rear window, and it might be that uh, even this non-intelligent implement here that doesn't have a hopper 
you can see that, okay, this gauge that shows you the hopper content, you don't really even need to make this electronically for a start. You could just look out the rear window. So instead of turning your back, you switch to the different camera view and have this as uh, some of the standards. And we can push this up. So we can actually have live fee from a field in Melbourne when we sit back home in the office in Aarhus and follow the operation with the same speed as the operator just walking a couple of hundred meters away. That's the power of the digital infrastructure which we are facing and we will only see growing even more. We were deeply concerned with the crisis emerging with, uh, between Russia uh, and Ukraine in the beginning of the year because when we've been monitoring um, GPS uh, precision uh, in the last uh, 10 years, We've always been able to see whenever East or West are doing a conflict, we can measure it in the precision of the GPS. This is the first season where we've actually not been able to measure it because even East or West are so relying on GPS that they don't even dare tampering with the signals because they know how relying society is on these signals. So that's been quite interesting to see how important this is. Um, though we've seen a, a gas pipe in... Uh, the Baltic Sea that had a leak. We also concerned there are also major uh, pipes uh, connecting our internet from the different continent. So we are also vulnerable in this, but it shows some of the powers in the infrastructure that we are, we are facing today. From us again, when we're choosing components, uh, we don't try to invent everything. We have Amazon Web Services as a fantastic uh, sparing partner. So we have a very close development collaboration with Amazon uh, where where they help us also in the understanding, optimization of data communication to servers. Because one thing is position data, uh, signal data. It might be a pressure signal from a hydraulic system or a temperature gauge. Um, these are low volume data uh, comparable. And, but it's something that we store and we need to make sure that we have it. We also have it available over time. But adding it, so whenever we take a picture out there, you could actually have, you can see this is from, a, uh, it's a, a robot running at Aarhus University where they also use it in the field experiment, so that's why the design. But you can see the amount of pictures. So in the, the lock system, you can go back in and then you can press any one of these and then you will have a full archive of the images. They can be utilized by others or they can be analyzed for, uh, for certain processing depends a bit on how much you pay for data bandwidth. Um, through these images, we can look at residue management. Um, it can be crop, stat crop status, what the growth status of the crops uh, is, the crops germinate uniformly. We've seen a lot of research papers looking at weed recognition. These are all benefits, but what we have now is basically the infrastructure to enable numerous other companies to benefit from this. And I think that's where a lot of companies in the agricultural sector have made flaws because they're trying to do everything themselves. We have engineers that are good at neural networks, but we also know that if someone's coming to ask for potato diseases, well, that's a very specific niche, and we know there are research group working intensively for that. It might be for sugar beets or cotton. It might be for insects. So we need to be able to share this data uh, because all these images is the farmers. So it depends on who he's calling to help adding value to, uh, to these kind of images. But that's where, where we have it, and we can see it can be used real time for the robot to uh, do the weeding in between the, the vegetables, uh, but it can also be do, used for, for spot spraying. Uh, the interesting thing here is we've seen a lot of researchers documenting spot spraying. This is an experiment we did at uh, Wageningen University in Lelystad where the robot was running with a sprayer just built for the example by T-Jet with standard components. It has an onboard camera system where it takes a picture. It's trying to recognize uh, volunteer potatoes in a sugar beet field. But what the special was here, what we wanted to demonstrate is it's taking a picture. It's uploading the picture to a server in Eindhoven. It's been the neural network algorithm running it's finding out which plant to spray and which not to spray. That's sent back before the robot has been moving 80 centimeters. It's only running two kilometers per hour, but still we did this and it was a 
uh, just a demo sponsored by the, uh, the Dutch uh, telecommunication company, KPN, because they wanted to show the benefit of 5G. So this is standard 5G internet that helps us actually doing this. Um, when a robot is running like this, with three meter working widths for eight hours, it's actually generating alone three terabyte of images. So having a, such a robot running 24 hours, you have 10 terabyte of images per robot if you wanted to save everything. So that's also where, as a researcher, you will need to learn what to ask for in future because there's a lot of data available. It opens up for spot spraying, spot fertilizing, plant uh, nutrient management. It might be the potato plant that's of interest. It might be the sugar beet. Well, it's up to the application. And we see this is, of course, where researchers and uh, um, other institutions are trying to document all these benefits. And I think this is really where we see huge benefits uh, of this technology emerging. So from our perspective, what is important here is also talking to agronomists and agro agricultural engineers. What we want to enable with this is our future generation that loves the soil and loves the plant have the time to actually do that instead of sitting up in the tractor cap and getting bored. They have the time to look at the plants, look at the soil, spend the time where that is creating value. And then whenever uh, we just need uh, tasks um, that just requires standardization, we'll leave the robot to do it. And then we can come back and evaluate the data uh, when we're ready for it. Thank you.